Nikki, um, I mentioned um, it earlier on. Can we, for those...
and which committee members are here and the officers who will be supporting us today. Thank you, uh, Chair. Right. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in the meeting room today, we have councillors William Armitage, Jane Barry, Andrew Pupa, Mark Foster, Carol Huckabee, Mo Potts, Alan Powell, Tracy Reader, Jackie Ridgeway, Kathy Rouse, Diana Ruff, and Ross Shipman as members of the planning committee. Also in attendance, we have councillors Charlotte Cupid and Heather Liggett, who are speaking today as ward members. In addition, we have a number of uh, members of the public who have registered to speak. We have John Shaw, Kevin Bush, Helen Lyman, Judy Wetton, and the agent for the application, John Dickinson. Members of staff who are with us today is we have a um, number of members of the governance team, which include Alan Ma, who will be the clerk for the meeting, and myself, who will facilitate the meeting, Nick Calver. Um, we have the head of planning, Richard Purcell, the planning manager, Adrian Kirkham, and Phil Slater, who is the um, case officer for this application, and uh, a solicitor in the room, Jim Fieldsend. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. As explained earlier today, we have a protocol in place for meeting in this way, which I would now like the meeting facilitator to read again. Thank you, Chair. So um, in the same way that we did for this morning session, all members of the committee are asked to keep their cameras on throughout the uh, duration of the meeting. Um, voting will be done by roll call. So this will be exactly the same as we do in the chamber. And, and I will call out names in alphabetical order. And if you can clearly indicate with a voice command either for, against or abstain. For speaking today, if you'd like to raise your hand, the chair will hopefully be able to see that from the chamber from her screens. If for any reason she is unable to see you, you can use the chat function and request to speak. Um, and I will also put prompts with closed captioning in front of you just to uh, make you aware that we've captured your wish to speak or to communicate anything that you need to know during the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any apologies for absence this afternoon? At Councillor Peter Elliott, Chair. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're on to the last application of the C for this afternoon. Sorry, uh, uh, declarations of interest. Oh, sorry, declarations of interest. Uh, are there any for this afternoon's meeting? Uh, none have been received, Chair. And then following on from that is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, is everybody happy with the minutes of the last meeting? Have you all read those? Yeah. Just have a show of hands. That looks approved, Chair. Thank you. Is there a mover for these to be accepted? I'll move them, Chair. And everyone's happy with them, that's fine, thank you. The main business of this afternoon is the final application. And it's for consideration of the planning application. However, before we do this, I'd like the clerk to explain for the benefit of members, speakers and the public who are watching you on YouTube, how it will be dealt with. Thank yes, you. thank you. Sorry, Chair. Yes, thank you, Chair. This is the procedure for considering the application at the meeting. The Chair will introduce the application and ask the planning officers to refer members to any late comments or updates received since the agenda was issued. The late items agenda supplement has been published on the council's website and the link has been sent to committee members. The planning officers will then give a brief presentation, setting out the application plans and photographs from the site. The screen showing this presentation will be shared with those attending the meeting. They can also be seen on the council's website through its YouTube channel. Following on from this, the chair will ask each of the speakers, any ward members first, followed by objectors, then the applicant or their agent, to speak to the committee. Each speaker will have three minutes to put forward their views using the conferencing facility. There will be a reminder given by the clerk when 30 seconds remain. At the end of the speaker's three minutes, members of the committee, We'll have the opportunity to ask the speakers questions if necessary to clarify any points that they have made. 
when we have heard from all the speakers on the application, the chair will open up the meeting for debate by the committee and determination by a vote. A note for speakers. After your contribution, you may leave the virtual meeting room. If you choose to remain, then please mute your microphone and turn off your camera. You will not be allowed to participate further in the meeting from that point. Now, as you're aware, this meeting is being live streamed. The council will make a recording for purposes of preparing the minutes. Once these minutes have been approved by the committee, then this recording will be deleted. Please note, however, that others may also record the live stream from the internet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll move to the uh, afternoon's application, which is NED forward slash 19.00.335 regarding Holfield Gate Lane at Sherland. Over to the planning officer. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a number of uh, updates. Um, first, I'd like to refer members to the late comments report. There's also been one email received last night from a resident at Fernley However, it has not raised any new issues not covered in the report. We have also received an email from residents of Hallfield Gate Lane that raises the following objections in summary. Number one, Sherland, historic context. The hamlet of Sherland appears in the Doomsday Manuscript. This naturally beautiful and rural setting is immediately adjacent a conservation area. Two, proposed development and sustainability. There is nothing sustainable about the proposed development and the residents won't be employed locally, therefore will need to travel by car. Supply of brownfield sites is sustainable and meets the requirements of the NEDDC Climate Change Plan. Number three, NEDDC Climate Change Plan 2019 to 2030. The proposed development fails to meet the stated targets within the NEDDC Climate Change Plan. Number four, wildlife habitat and local amenity. The local history, landscape, natural habitats and wildlife combine to become a valuable local amenity enjoyed by residents and visitors alike. In summary, the residents of Sherland do not want or need this new development. Hundreds of new houses are already being built in the village. Uh, we've also had uh, a phone call from a Mr. John Robinson who has, who has just returned from holiday and wishes that his presence is registered to committee and he does not wish to speak. He also wishes it to be known that he is a naturist and that the application would be intimidating and an impact on his privacy. If we could turn to the presentation, please, Nikki. Thank you. have the, uh, the first slide that's great as set out in the report the site lies outside of the defined settlement development limit for Sherland and lies within open countryside proposals would provide 20 percent affordable housing on site and section 106 contributions to primary and secondary education there are no technical objections from the statutory consultees uh, on the slide, this slide shows the application site shaded in the center of the screen. To the north is Hallfield Gate Lane. To the west is the Hallfield Gate Conservation Area. To the south is Sherland Golf Club. And to the east lies Pitt Lane. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. This shows the red line application site boundary. The shaded area running north to south is proposed as a biodiversity enhancement corridor and open space. Could have uh, slide three, please. Thank you. This shows the proposed access arrangements. The development will be served by a single point of access on Hawfield Gate Lane. The trees that front Hawfield Gate Lane are protected by a tree preservation order. The access proposals include an 0.75 metre build out on the southern side of the lane to provide sight lines clear of existing trees. Proposals include an amendment to the existing parking bays on the north side of Hallfield Gate Lane to ensure dimensions are maintained and also the relocation of the bus stop on the north side. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows the indicative layout. To the north is a new access onto Hawfield Gate Lane. The layout provides a gap between the development and the conservation area to the west, whilst providing a continuation of properties fronted onto Hawfield Gate Lane in the northwest corner. A biodiversity enhancement and open space corridor is shown running north to south between the two fields and down the existing tree line. To the south, the scheme is generally outward facing towards the golf course. To the north, the site is adjacent to the rear gardens of houses on Hawfield Gate Lane, and additional planting is proposed to the rear of the houses with the shorter rear gardens and to provide an additional buffer. Next slide, please. This photo is taken from Byron Street opposite the site and is looking towards the conservation area. The trees on the opposite side are the ones protected by a tree preservation order. Right, next slide, please. This photo is looking east and shows a proposed access point where the current access is located and also shows for more of the protected trees. Right, next slide, please. This photo is taken at the site entrance looking east. The trees in the photo would be retained and form part of the biodiversity corridor. The main development would be beyond the trees. Next slide, please. This is a view looking south from Hallfield Gate Lane. This is where the properties fronting the lane would be sited, closest to the conservation area. Next slide, please. So another view from Hallfield Gate Lane looking back towards the conservation area. The new house will be located in this part of the field. Post and rail fence roughly shows location of the proposed new access. Next slide, please. This is a view from the footpath of Pitt Lane to the east of the site. This shows the main area of the development. To the north and the right-hand side of the photograph are the rear gardens of houses on Hawfield Gate Lane. Next slide, please. It's a further photo from uh, the footpath on Pitt Lane. The next slide, please. This is a view from the Pitt Lane footpath looking northeast towards the existing houses on Hawfield Gate Lane. Application site will be to the left of the hedgerow in the photo. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, this is a view from the footpath to the southwest of the site. Uh, the photo is looking roughly northeast and again shows the houses on Hawfield Gate Lane. Development will be in the fields to the rear of these houses. Next slide, please. Another photo from the footpath looking northeast. You can see the church in the background and the golf course can be seen in the top left of the photo. No, sorry, top right of the photo. This is a more distant view uh, taken from the footpath. Uh, which runs towards the golf course. Houses on Hallfield Gate Lane can be seen in the distance. And the final slides photo again looking northeast from the footpath. The development will be largely sited beyond the three trees in the center of the photo. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the planning officer at this stage? Wow. Okay, we'll move on to the first speaker then. And it's the ward member, Councillor Charlotte Coopit. Hello, Councillor. If you'd like to introduce yourself and then it's three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm Councillor Charlotte Coopit and I'm speaking against the application today. Um, I'm here today as a ward member to highlight the damage this application would cause as an unsustainable development in what is clearly open countryside. As you can see, even just from the maps in your pack, this proposed site doesn't in any way relate to or infill with the main part of Sherland. It would quite clearly be outside the established settlement line and development limit visibly marked by the currently linear housing pattern boundary. This area at the moment is clearly rural, open green fields and countryside with far reaching views across the valley vice versa from the surrounding fields and from as far away as Amber Valley, this area can clearly be seen and marks out the prevailing rural character of our district. 
In a similar way, at the bottom end of the application site lies the highlighted Hallfield Gate conservation area with several listed and historically important buildings. Whilst the application has been amended to slightly move away from this area, it's still the case that this proposed development would have a significant adverse impact on the historic setting of these buildings and on the conservation area. Previous appeal decisions on smaller applications near this conservation area have recognised that a main characteristic of it is the open fields and gardens reflective of the surrounding open countryside. Indeed, the October 2019 conservation consultant comments on this application recognises the importance of the remaining open fields in this application to the rural setting of the conservation area and considers these views as important. Just from the consul consultant's conservation opinions, they consider that the whole field directly to the east should remain as open space, whereas that field is clearly still marked out for quite a few houses in the proposals. Uh, CPRE Derbyshire also recognise and support all these concerns and have also strongly objected to the plans on the wider basis, and I quote, that the proposed development would irreversibly change the essential rural quality of the south side of Sherland, and the character of Sherland would be changed from village to suburb. Therefore, particularly given the development currently underway on the other side of the road, the 92 houses, this application would overload the area and cannot be considered as sustainable. Even just from an affordable housing point of view, the council's housing strategy officer has stated, and I quote, Sherland is a small village in which there have been a number of developments in recent times, so there is not currently a high demand here, and at the current time it is not seen as a suitable site even for affordable housing provision. So as a final point, it may already be clear, or I'm sure it will be to you, that the number of resident speakers who are following the application, uh, but I also want to highlight the significant number of written objections and the many people currently watching the live stream. This demonstrates, I think, the strength of local feeling that this de development would saturate and exhaust the village of Sherland and destroy cherished and countryside. So I hope you listen to these concerns and refuse this speculative application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions at this stage? Oh, goodness. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Heather Liggett. Good afternoon. Um, Heather Liggett speaking against uh, this development. On May the 9th, 2013, Wieldons were given permission to build 90 plus houses between the A61 and Hallfield Gate Lane. Why was it that they were not allowed to build without two, ex two entrances? These development, these development, this development is for the same amount of housing. The Wieldons development was split into two. The east exit onto the A61, the south exit onto Lilac Way, which comes out onto Hallfield Gate Lane, only a few yards from the proposed new development entrance. This will mean an increase of approximately 300 more cars using what, as the name suggests, is a lane. The so-called walk to school from the back of the development would come out across the fairway onto the golf course. How safe is that for children? The teeing off would be straight towards oncoming children. This is a village. The infrastructure can't cope. Our nearest doctors is at Stoneroom, part of the Staffer Group, which is possibly closing. At least a six-week wait for phone lines, even if you need one because of medical needs, a buzzer for accidents, Alzheimer's, etc. Sewers bursting 14 times in the last four and a half years. Sanitary towels, etc. feet from where the new houses will be, built, will be built at the east side of the estate. Surface water flooding, which has increased since the wilderness development, even though we were assured it wouldn't. Gas Cottage has been flooded right through twice. It's only 75 metres from where the new houses will be built. The school is full. So is the school in the next village of Wessington. New residents on the Wieldons estate are taking their children to Kreit School. This is before the Wieldons estate is even finished being built, never mind sold and lived in. I am also very concerned about safety from golf balls. We collect around 50 a year from our field, right next to the proposed site. Gas Cottage has suffered so many cracked tiles, Mr Southey has had to replace his utility roof this year. His father was also hit on the head by a golf ball some years ago and suffered strokes and memory loss afterwards. To put housing right up to a golf course is madness. People wouldn't be safe in their own gardens. We simply do not need or want any more houses in our village. The infrastructure cannot and will not cope. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Are there any questions? 
Okay, moving on to the next speaker. The first one I have on my list is the Mr. John Shaw. Hello, Mr. Shaw, if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Unmute. There you, you go. Got me? If you'd like to introduce yourself and then you have three minutes. Yeah, my name is John Shaw. I've lived in Sherland since 1953. Between 1964 and 67, I worked for George Shipman, who actually lived in Oldfield Gate Hall. He was the main contractor for subsidence work for the NCB. I worked as an apprentice joiner and worked on subsidence in Sherland, including Oldfield Gate Lane to the north and the south side. The work involved is indoors, windows, making good to plaster work, etc. Sherland was quite badly hit by subsidence, and one house in Stretter Lane, only two fields away, north side of Oldfield Gate Lane, had to be totally rebuilt. I also remember the open cast in Sherland, and the whole area was devastated by the, by the south and the west side. I remember large holes where coal was extracted. It's taken 60 years to re-establish itself. Now the edge roads and wildlife are flourishing. Mining was a big part of Sherland and the large coal extraction beneath the ground could cause big problems for the new build. I'm also concerned about the traffic on the build. This will cause problems for maybe a year, two years, three years, heavy plant, machinery, deliveries, concrete, tarmac, stone, you name it. There's a lot of traffic needed to build one house and is applying for 90. The exit also leading onto the A61 is quite notorious for, for locals. We use it readily. It's a difficult junction for large vehicles. You, as you come up from the south of the A61, turning onto Oldfield Gate Lane, if you're in a large vehicle, the sight of view is quite obstructive. I know this because I've got a large vehicle myself, and it's difficult, especially if there's a car or a lorry wanting to come out onto the A61. With the traffic involved in the new bill, will cause endless problems. I totally disagree with the planning application that has been made by Mr. Speed. With all its complications, once the green land has gone, once the green land has gone, it has gone. I urge the committee to reflect on my notes and reject the application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. Yeah. The next speaker I have listed is the Mr. Ian North. Mr. North, if you'd like to unmute yourself and state your name. Good afternoon. My name's Ian North and I'm a resident on Hallfield Gate Lane. Hallfield Gate Lane is a small but busy village road. The recent increase of housing to the north of the lane has made it increasingly dangerous to drive along. It is effectively a single lane road because the residents on the north side of the road have no option but to park their vehicles on it. Therefore, the addition of a further 90 houses to the south of the lane would almost certainly double the amount of traffic used in the lane. The increase of vehicles on the lane would undoubtedly cause a great deal of stress danger and almost certainly damage and injury or worse to the residents of the lane and those who use it. I would therefore ask you to consider the effect these 90 houses and the massive increase of vehicles would have on the already suffering residents of Hallfield, Hallfield Gate Lane and the whole population of Sherland. We must also remember that the wildlife of the surrounding area will most certainly be negatively affected also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, is. Um, the next one on the list is Mr. Kevin Bush. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Mr Bush, would you like to introduce yourself and then it's three minutes. I'm Kevin Bush and I'm a resident who is objecting to the proposal. And I wish to talk about the local plan. In both the previous and emerging local plans, this area falls outside of the settlement development limit as determined by the council policy LC1, which covers land allocated for development. In my view, the fact that there has been a gap in the effective period of the previous plan and the implementation of the new cannot mean that they are left completely at the mercy of speculative development. In no other walk of life do changes in legislation mean that current law is suspended whilst new laws are drafted. In any event, we are in the very last phase of consultation for the new local plan. As it has such a late stage with only areas to the north of the district still subject to discussion, and with no further consultation plan for the area in question, it is reasonable to expect that the provisions of the new plan are given full weight in this case. In particular, the housing supply estimates for Sherland have already been met and exceeded for the life of the new plan. Commissions have already been granted on the allocated sites for Sherland in the draft local plan for around 130 houses. Another 90 here would lead to a near 70% oversupply of housing against projected need. It is a fact that the applicant has made a number of attempts to have this area of land included in the new plan and on every occasion, the planning inspectorate has rejected the proposal. It would be quite wrong to allow this application to be backdoored in contravention of what is clearly the considered view of the inspectorate after a very lengthy period of consultation with the widest range of consultees. The tone of the officer's report in general seems to play down the weight of the emerging plan. This leads on to my next point, planning policies SDC3 and GS6 are clear. Developments that cause significant harm to the open character of the land, loss of amenity or which form a prominent intrusion into open country should not be permitted. The land is agricultural and forms part of the open rural landscape. The officer's report does not give due regard to these factors, in my opinion, and underestimates the negative impact of this development. Finally, part of the argument for approval refers to the land being adjacent to existing settlement. Every piece of green space in this country or anywhere else is adjacent to a settlement. That is why I urge that decisions that are made within the framework of the local plan, if we are to protect the countryside from speculative proposals, proposals that irreversibly damage precious and increasingly scarce rural immunity. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. The next speaker I have on my list is Helen Linham. Hello. Well, good afternoon. If you'd like to introduce yourself and then it's three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Well, Helen Linham. I live on Hawfield Gate Lane. I'm objecting to the proposal. I wish to highlight the traffic issues on Hawfield Gate Lane. The additional traffic from the existing developments and this proposed development is unsustainable. This will cause problems for all residents of Hallfield Gate Lane and adjoining roads. Hallfield Gate Lane is already busy and is used by many motorists as a rat run and a cut through in both directions. The traffic surveys accompanying this application were written in 2017 prior to the additional traffic that has been created by new housing both in Sherland and the surrounding areas. We have not yet felt the full impact of the housing development to the north of Hawfield Gate Lane as it is still under development, so that coupled with this proposal would lead to traffic chaos. Each new home is likely to have at least one car, probably two, all to be used for commuting or the school run, which is due to the lack of, which due to the lack of places in Sherland School, this is likely to be outside of the village. With this and the other local developments, it's estimated to, well, to be well over 300 additional car journeys will be made per day along the lane. While the junctions at either end of the road are stated in the highways report to have been fit for purpose, I can only say this is far from the case in practice. It is quite common already to have to queue to join the A61 and the speeding traffic at the Belfer Road Junction is also an issue when time to join from Hawfield Gate Lane. As a local resident, I feel the issues have been overlooked through lack of local knowledge. For a distance of about 150 metres, the road is effectively single track due to parked cars. It is not uncommon to see vehicles mounting the pavements to avoid queuing, putting pedestrians at great risk. This single track section lies between the proposed site exit and the A61, increasing the danger to pedestrians. The applicant suggests that 80% of traffic leaving this proposed development will travel towards the A61. 
Refuse collection and some deliveries can bring this road to a total standstill along this section. This road is not designed for existing volumes of traffic, never mind increased volumes. While few incidents are reported to the police, it's not unusual to witness accidents. One writing off my neighbour's car, other incidents ranging from clipped mirrors, road rage and speed. 50 seconds remain. These incidents can only increase the proposed increase in traffic. The main bus stop on A61 will be 800 metres away. Sherlin School, if places were to be available, will be up to one kilometre away. Both of these distances make it more likely that any new residents will use their cars, adding to the problem. I would urge the committee to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No. The next speaker I have is Judy Wetton. Hello, I'm Judy, Judy Wetton. I'm in the home. If you'd like to introduce yourself and you've got three minutes. Hello, my name's Judy Wetton and I live in Higham. Um, you think you sounded all right? Try again. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. I want to talk about safety. I'm sure that the planning committee and its officers would agree that before any application is approved, every element of public safety must be considered. Unfortunately, this is not true where this, this development is concerned. Unfortunately, the most basic need for children to have a safe route to and from school has not been considered. So if children leave the proposed housing estate by the only exit that exists on the onto Hallfield Gate Lane, they must exit onto a road with no pavement. Children will be left standing on the side of the road waiting for a break in traffic before they could cross to a pavement on the opposite side. This lane is very busy, narrow and dangerous. Conversely, the children could use the back route from the estate via a public footpath suggested and described very eloquently by the applicant. The first challenge for the children would be to actually get onto the public footpath which runs across the golf course. To do so, they must trespass onto the golf course itself when they would doubtless be greeted with hostility from any golfers as this path actually crosses the fairway. With some luck, the children may avoid being seriously injured by a golf ball. Following the path, the children would then climb a stile and enter a field in which usually two highland cattle with their legendary enormous horns roam freely. At the moment, the huge beasts are on loan to a local farmer, but the owner tells me that they could return at any time. The next obstacle would be Pit Lane, a dark, overgrown, narrow road leading to Sherlin Golf Club. Not wide enough for cars to pass each other, vehicles reverse and manoeuvre around blind bends, causing chaos. Since this is a private, unadopted road, vehicles are not bound by the rules of insurance, licensing or even driving, as they would be on a public road. To summarise from this housing development, there will be no safe way for children to walk to school. Being elected as a councillor is a huge responsibility because the general public expects the decisions taken on their behalf by councillors will be fair, logical and reasonable and will reflect and respond to the wishes of local residents. I would respectfully ask members of the planning committee to think Second very well about the safety of these children, of these children when considering the application. The people of Sherland will see no benefit if permission is granted. In fact, the only person to benefit from this proposal is a multi-millionaire who lives in his own manor house many miles from Sherland and who recently sold Hallfield Gate Hall for well over a million pounds. Please vote against this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No? Thank you. Our next speaker is Alan Coltrane. Hello. Hello, if you'd like to introduce you. yourself, you have three minutes. Okay, uh, my name is Alan Cochrane. 
Um, I'm a resident uh, on the south side of Hallfield Gate Lane. Um, I want to talk about uh, the hist history of the area and the su sustainability um, of this development. To understand this setting, we have to understand the history. Sherland is listed in the Doomsday Book. St Leonard's Church dates from 1226. Sherland Manor existed on the site where Manor Farm is today. Maps published in the 1840s show the field boundaries and hedgerows much as they are today. It is unchanged. The historic and rural setting is adjacent to a conservation area and the centuries-old sheep lane. The historical context is enhanced by the wider landscape, which incorporates Amber Valley, Wingfield Manor and the ancient Roman Road. All of this combines to describe a historical landscape and the setting that provides a valuable local amenity that is accessed by the local network of footpaths. The application to build 90 dwellings is not a sustainable solution and is completely out of context with the described setting. The application is in direct conflict with eight of the sustainable targets shown in the authority's own climate change plan. There is no additional infrastructure. There are no extra schools, shops, healthcare, leisure or childcare facilities. Children from the Wielding development are already being driven to Crite School because there are no places at Sherman Primary School. For employment, residents will be travelling by car to Derby, Nottingham, Manfield, Chessfield, Sheffield and beyond. They will put more pressure on the existing road network, particularly Hallfield Gate Lane, Alfreton, Claycross and Oakathorpe. The extra car journeys will increase pollution and they will impact on the safety of the residents. The daily occurrences of road rage vehicles driving on the pedestrian pavements of Hallfield Gate Lane will increase and this is a school route for local children. I don't think this is acceptable. The authority already has enough land to meet its target for new builds. In addition, the sustainable development report published by the Campaign to Protect Rural England shows there is enough suitable brownfield land available in England for more than 1 million homes, over 18,000 sites and 26,000 hectares. There is no need to build on this land. I urge you to do something better. Do something sustainable. The landscape is also a natural wildlife habitat. The hares, badgers, hedgehogs, owls, buzzards and much more don't get a mention in this application. Several of these are under protection in the UK. This is an ancient, beautiful and rural setting that provides a wildlife habitat and an extremely valuable local immunity that is widely enjoyed by the local residents. The development is out of context with the setting. That's it's not minutes, sustainable. Yeah. It's not needed, wanted or supported by the residents. I urge you to stop this application. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? No. Uh, right. I've got Richard Southey. Is the my next speaker? Yes, Chair. I shall be reading this for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Southey as they can't make the meeting. Thank you. Okay. My concern regarding the proposed development on land to the south of Hullfield Gate Lane, Sherland in Derbyshire, is related to surface water and flooding. Our garden has flooded many times on our house twice in recent years, making house insurance an extremely expensive commodity. Under the heading Technical Considerations 4.0, claims which state the site does not fall within an area designated as being at risk from flooding or false. It also claims that the risk is low and the proposed development will be located in flood zone one and that it will not displace flood water in the one in 100 year event and therefore no flood water storage mitigation measures are proposed. If this application is conditionally approved without flood water storage and our property floods again, I will take this personally and hold any DDC liable and take legal action as we were assured that we would not be affected by surface water or flooding from the ongoing Fox Hollies development on Main Road, Sherland, which has a flood, water, air flood storage facility, which is totally inadequate as muddy and clay-coloured water from that development 
is still reaching us down here and troubling us when we were reassured that it would not. I reiterate, we cannot take any more surface water coming our way. The design and access statement relating to the Halfield Gate proposed development clearly indicates that it is their intention to direct surface water down to us. For this reason, and purely this reason, and no other, we object to planning permission being granted. The design and access statement is full of untruths regarding flood risk. And that's from Mr. A. Southey and Mrs. J. M. Southey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we've got no one to answer questions. Um, the last speaker I've got on my list is the agent John Dickinson. Hello, Mr. Dickinson, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then it's three minutes. Good afternoon, Chair and Members. I'm John Dickinson of WYG. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'm John Dickinson of WYG, the planning agent for the applicant. The proposed development of 90 houses would comprise a sustainable urban extension to the southwest of Sherland. The officer's report confirms that the local plan only made provision for housing up to 2011 and safe housing policies dealing with settlement development limits and housing targets cannot be relied upon. In addition, the emerging local plan is unadopted and can only be given limited weight at this stage. The National Planning Policy Framework confirms that decisions should apply a presumption in favour of sustainable development, which in this case means granting permission unless policies in the framework that protect areas or assets of particular importance provide a clear reason for refusal or any adverse impact of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies in the framework taken as a whole. The officer's report notes that the scheme is broadly sustainable and not detrimental to the landscape character of the district or the wider countryside, with any impact being localised and limited. The officer's report recognises that the scheme will provide significant social benefits with the delivery of housing, including 20% affordable homes and Section 106 contributions to education. The economic benefits of the scheme include jobs and spend during the construction phase, and spend by occupants of the houses in the local economy, along with benefits to the council, including the new homes bonus. The officer's report notes that the scheme is considered to preserve the character of the nearby conservation area, and any localised harm is offset by the public benefits that accrue. The officer's report recognises that the scheme has the potential to offer good design that would be in keeping with the character and appearance of the surrounding area, and that it would not result in any detrimental impact upon the privacy or amenity of neighbouring residents. In relation to consultee responses, there are no technical objections or matters weighing against the scheme, and the officer's report confirms that, following consultation with the Highways Authority, the scheme would not have a detrimental impact on highway safety. We welcome the conclusion of the officer's report that the scheme accords with the policies of the development plan and their recommendation that subject to the completion of the seconds remain. section 106 agreement and conditions that permission should be granted. In this respect, we would request that members approve the application in line with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Shipman? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered if Mr Dickinson could explain to the Planning Committee what sustainable benefits of development has, because all the things that he's mentioned, such as, um, you know, the new homes bonus and people buying the house, they're all things you could apply to any single development that comes before this committee. There's nothing I don't see that's specific to this development, which is giving us a sustainable benefit to the people of Sherland or the wider area. So I just wondered if there's anything that he had that was additional to what he's told us already to, to offer this as a sustainable development, because so far I've heard absolutely nothing which would convince me that this is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any response? 
Thank you. Well, well, the officers have carefully considered the socio-economic benefits, and during the construction phase, it's anticipated that um, a proportion of the jobs um, will be taken up by um, local people, as well as those who may travel from further afield. Um, in addition, there'll be um, spend in the local economy during um, this um, construction phase of the scheme, and once residents occupy the houses, they will also contribute to the local economy by um, their spend in the area. Councillor Armitage. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> you say that uh, the uh, it's sustainable, but how can you make out that it's sustainable when there are no school uh, places in the primary school and uh, the doctors uh, are overstretched. I mean, perhaps could you you could answer this question for me? Th th thank you. Um, officers consulted with Derbyshire County Council, and they've requested a financial contribution for primary and secondary school places, which totals almost eight hundred thousand pounds which they would allocate for Im improvements at um, um, schools in, in the locality. Um, also, the offices consulted with the um, Healthcare um, Trust, and they did not request any financial contributions um, in relation to this scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Are there any questions to the planning officers before we move on? No? Okay. So we're now going into the final part of our process of our discussions of, of regarding what we've just heard and what we think and what we wish to decide. But before we go any further, I'd like our clerk to remind us about motions. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, please bear in mind, members, that a motion must be moved and seconded before a vote is taken. If an amendment to a motion is moved and seconded then that amendment will be voted on first. If a motion is to be moved, which goes against the officer recommendations, then the member who has moved the motion must give the reasons for doing so. The reasons for moving a motion against officer recommendations should comprise the relevant planning issues and be supported by evidence as necessary. If a motion to um, reject officer recommendations fails, or in other words, it is not passed, that doesn't mean that say that the, the recommendations themselves are automatically approved. Rather, you will need to take a positive decision through a further motion in favor of the recommendations or another course of action. This will need to be approved by the committee through another vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Armitage, did you wish to say something? Uh, I'd like to uh, just to make one or two uh, comments uh, on this and give some reasons. I, uh, <clears throat> I move that uh, we go against officer's recommendation. Uh, I've got, uh, if we look at GS1 uh, about the uh, sustainability, uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, there are, uh, the school places are very limited and the doctor's uh, surgery. If we go to uh, GS6, it's outside the settlement uh, development area. It's in open countryside and uh, it'll be detrimental to wildlife and one thing or another. Uh, and any one uh, landscape, it will certainly be a detrimental effect on the uh, uh, greenfield sites that we've got. If we go then to, uh, it's right next to the uh, conservation area, the Hallfield Gate, uh, and that would be uh, in contravention to BE11. 
Uh, <clears throat> the housing supply, it's been noted that we've got a, a seven year housing supply and uh, it's been met. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, I would go against officer's recommendation and turn this one down. And the reasons are the ones that I've given. Thank you. Councillor uh, Adrian Kirkham, sorry. Adrian, you're on mute. Apologies, uh, Chair. Um, I'm happy to come in now. I do know Councillor Shipman had his hands raised. Chair, I'm happy to come in now or after Councillor Shipman, whatever, uh, whatever you'd like. Should we wait to see what Councillor Shipman has to say and then you can all answer them all? Yes, Chair. Um, Councillor Shipman? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going back to what um, I think it was Mr Bush said in his comments earlier, that um, it's not right that we're adopting things even though a, a, the previous plan is out of date and the new one's not been adopted. Because actually the National Pl Planning Policy Framework specifies that we can make reference to the previous one and we should give, especially given the stage that the current one's at, we should be giving it significant weight because it's in its advanced stages. And therefore, I would say that um, I don't believe this uh, development offers a solution to any of the problems raised in today by multiple people that have raised concerns uh, about this development. Um, I think uh, residents who, uh, who live here would be heading in three directions for employment. They would be going north to Chesterfield up the A61, which we know is a bad road. They would be going south to Alfreton, which we know is a bad road. Or they would be going east towards M1 Junction 28 or 29, which Junction 28 to 29 is one of the longest stretches of M1. And as soon as that's closed off, it causes un unbelievable stress on the road networks in that area. So I think we need to take that into account when we're looking at adding additional stress onto the A61 and this section um, of North East Derbyshire. Um, I, would also, I would also like to add that the County Council explained that the local primary school at Sherland is full. This is what the County Council have said in their comments, it's full. And therefore, there's no, uh, then there's no scope to expand the primary school at Sherland. What they would have to do is they would have to allocate the Section 106 money that's generated from this development to Sherland, the primary school at Woollymore, or even worse, in my mind, to give it to outside the district to a secondary school in Alfreton. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. And to say that's sustainable is bonkers, to be quite honest with you. Um, so we can't do much about the approved, the already approved developments along the A61, but as a planning committee, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're not adding additional stress onto this section of road. Um, and I would like to second uh, Council Armitage's uh, motion to reject the officer's uh, recommendations, because I don't think that they, we, we, we have this, I feel like we have this same discussion, even when I've watched planning committees previously to me being on here, that we, we talk as though the plan, national policy, policy framework shouldn't be, be giving weight to the existing or emerging plans. And it's just totally wrong to suggest that. Um, and I think we can reject it under many parts of the national pol pl uh, planning policy framework. Uh, the one about we should be giving, um, we should be giving um, weight to the emerging plan, um, which I believe is 48A, if I'm, if I'm right. And uh, there's 49 uh, a and B, again, talking about cumulative development, um, and it talks about the emerging of the advanced stage of the emerging plan. Um, and I think that, um, additionally to what Council Armitages has said, and the effects it would have on the locality in Sherland, and the how unsustainable this development is, I think it should be rejected on those on those reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Adrian, if you'd like to come back on those comments. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to address um, some points as well, which I'd uh, ask members to exercise great caution in placing weight on, and then come back to those which um, I believe members um, should place weight on in, in their planning assessment of the application, Chair. Um, Councillor Armitage mentioned, first of all, policies GS1 and GS6 and housing supply. Uh, we have set out in the officer report um, some detail the views on those particular policies and issues and they are reflective of comments made to it on many numbers of appeals by planning inspectors and the issue is that the presumption against new development outside settlement development limits as set out in our extant local plan 
we're advised time and time again that because of the time scale of that plan and where we are now, our IE nine plus years um, in advance of that, that we can't rely purely and simply on sites lying outside settlement development limits as a reason to refuse them. And that's because the National Planning Policy Frame, as, as Councillor Shipman has just said, doesn't place a presumption against new development outside urban areas and in countryside. So I'd ask members to be very, very careful and I'd urge members not to resist the application purely and simply on the site's location outside the settlement development limit and within an area of countryside. Just in terms, again, of the, the issue that Councillor Shipman made about the development plan and the emerging plan, yes, you must determine this application in accordance with the policies of your development plan, i.e. the 2001-2011 extant plan, that must be a starting point unless material considerations or indicate otherwise. I've just outlined specifically why the policies in respect of settlement limits are not consistent with the framework. And therefore, I urge members to not place weight on the fact that this site lies outside a settlement limit. And I'll come back to other issues in a second, if, if you will spare with me, Chair. The issue about the emerging plan that Councillor Shipman quite rightly makes the point is yes, the weight to be attached to the policy of your emerging plan is for the decision maker, i.e. planning committee, and that's for you to weigh this afternoon. All, again, I would urge is that inspectors are saying that on the issue of housing generally, there are issues that aren't um, not with objection to the existing plan. The inspector is still to make a final judgment on those issues, and therefore the council is in a position to adopt the plan. Therefore, I do urge members to be careful in the way you do attach to your emerging plan. As officers, as it out in the report, we've advised you place limited weight on the plan. But ultimately, that's a matter for you as the decision maker. Just before I come on to policies, anyone sharing the, the issue of heritage assets, I'd just like to address again the issue that Councillor Shipman raised with regards to um, certainly the highway network. Um, on the highway issue, as with all the technical issues here, you'll see that there aren't any technical issues set out by your advisors, i.e. the, the statutory consultees, to refuse the application. And I've not heard evidence this afternoon that you can attach to any of those technical considerations to resist the application on that basis. Again, I'd urge extreme caution and advise you against um, having issues such as highway safety and flooding as determining factors in your consideration. Just on the issues that um, I do believe members um, have discretion and can attach weight as they see fit to, Chair, and they, they do relate, as Councillor Armitage rightly mentioned, to the policy of NE1 in your extant local plan, which is replicated by the emerging plan policies and also um, various um, policies in the MPPF, and that's in relation to the protection of the countryside, not for its own sake necessarily, but to protect the character and appearance of those areas and again um, coming back to inspectors decisions weight has been placed on for example your policy any one which seeks to protect the character landscape character of northeast derbyshire and um, in terms of mppf paragraphs 170 which talks about um, recognizing the intrinsic character and beauty of the countryside and there's a general policy there to um, conserve and enhance the countryside so yes you can attach weight to that issue and i'd ask you to and pay particular um, attention to that and you'll need to judge whether you believe development of this site for housing, the extent that it is, is detrimental and would harm the character of the area. Officers have concluded that that harm isn't overriding, that is a view that you do have to take a view and come to a planning judgment on. The second issue, Chair, again Councillor Armitage mentioned this and that is the issue of the nearby conservation area, you are statutorily required to pay special regard to that and the setting of the conservation area. And um, if you feel that the conservation area is harmed, um, I would say because the development wouldn't obliterate the conservation area, you can't say it has absolute harm. So it's less than substantial in MPPF terms, what weight and what impact you think that is. And then your judgment has to be do public benefits of the scheme outweigh that harm? And officers have concluded that the public benefits 
um, generic benefits admittedly, but um, additional housing and all that that brings, that is in this case sufficient to override that harm, bearing in mind the distinction that the development site now has from the conservation area and the way that officers believe it could be designed. But again, the, um, the heritage issues is something that members will need to take a view on. It's set out in the report and our view as officers. Um, and we believe that, that um, the public benefits does override the lessons from substantial harm in our opinion. But again, that's a matter for um, you and your colleagues, Chair, in making your decision this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, sorry, Chair, there's just one, one other point. Um, Councillor Chipman, Chipman also mentioned the issue about infrastructure, and particularly school places, and it's also been raised in respect of doctor surgeries and healthcare. You'll see from the consultation responses the requirement to address both of those issues in absolute terms, and the um, NHS advisors have not requested any 106 contributions towards health provision or identified any um, deficiency. Whereas with regards to school places, the County Council have specifically asked for sums of money to address those issues. Now, whether those places are provided out with the district, in my opinion, isn't um, a matter that you should place significant weight on. It's just addressing those shortfalls. And again, um, I'd urge caution on that issue. Um, you need to assess what evidence, if any, you have to show that that shortfall can't be met. And again, I would say that the responses you've had from the consultee um, consultees on that issue suggest that shortfall can be met. And uh, I would ask you to look very carefully at that as well. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for coming back in. Thank you. Are there any further questions, issues that anyone wants to raise? No? Good. I'm just reading my notes. Um, right. Having heard and read everything today, the officer's recommendations before us, which is the view of committee on the application, I'm now opening the floor for the motions. I think we've had a mover and second, haven't we, Chair? Yeah, we have a, a mover and second. Going for? Okay. Officer recommendations, but it's not yet clear exactly what grounds you wish to actually attach to that. Could I come in here? Certainly. Uh, as uh, Adrian has said, uh, as far as I could see, uh, he says that uh, any one uh, that the landscape uh, and it will have a, a detrimental effect, and that seems to be the strongest one. Uh, I still think that uh, BE11, uh, it's next to a conservation area. Uh, he seems to think that uh, the, uh, uh, what shall I say, the uh, uh, advantage of this uh, site will outweigh, uh, outweighs any detrimental effect to the conservation area, but uh, I don't think so. Uh, and <clears throat> I think that B11 uh, still stands. The sustainability, well, that's certainly in uh, in doubt, and he's urged caution uh, about that, and also the fact that it's outside the settlement development area and in open countryside. <clears throat> he seems to uh, urge caution on that. So going forward, I think it will be the landscape and uh, and the conservation area. Uh, the housing supply, as far as I'm concerned, has been met and uh, <clears throat> uh, it would be detrimental to have more houses uh, in the, on this site. So there you have it. So is that effectively then um, the issue about landscape, proximity to the housing, uh, sorry, proximity to a conservation area and the oversupply of housing? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Would uh, Council Shipman agree with me on it? Yes, I would. I, I would. Uh, I'll second that. Thank I think you. we have to. Get, uh, if I could just come back to, I, I think we have to be very careful on technical things like the highways because 
unless uh, we are we've got technical uh, evidence, then it's uh, very unsafe. Come back to you, Adrian. Yes, Chair. I appreciate uh, Councillor Armitage's help on those those issues, Chair. Um, as far as I um, read it, um, the the vote will be taken on um, a concern that the development of this site would have an adverse impact on the landscape character of the area, and that's contrary to your local plan policy NE1 um, and also the outline policies in the MPPF chair. Um, if you would like, we can add in the emerging policies that are similar in those, sorry, the policies in your emerging plan that are similar to policy NE1. And also Chair Councillor Armitage is, is saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Armitage, if you will, but you're saying that the um, uh, public benefits in this case are limited and don't outweigh the harm to the character of the conservation area, Hallfield Gate. I think it's Hallfield, Hallfield Gate conservation area. Um, and again, there are policies, Chair, and elements within the MPPF that could be added into that. But again, um, you have similar policies in your emerging plan with relation to heritage assets, which again, we can we can add in. Yeah. And uh, finally, Chair, if it's, uh, it's okay with you, Based on that framework, um, I would suggest if members are minded to refuse the application, the final wording is delegated to myself in consultation with yourself and Councillor Barry as Vice Chair. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this, this motion that's going to go forward, that's been put forward now, which looks to be put forward, um, I've listened to those, uh, those reasons for rejection that are that have been put down, that have been suggested. Could Adrian give us um, an opinion on the strength of those and how they're likely to stand up possibly at appeal? Thank you. Um, members will have heard me say this before, Chair. I, I'm afraid I've, um, I've given up trying to predict uh, appeal decisions. Um, but what I would say is that um, we've two um appeals that i know of of recently um one that was for um uh, development of an up, uh, over 200 houses at little morton road at north wingfield where argument in relation to landscape character was successful and the appeal was dismissed um, thanks largely to expert advice we got on landscape impact from um someone we've worked closely with on a number of appeals now um, more recently, an appeal at Sherland, not far from this site, um, was allowed um, on Common Lane at Sherland. So I, I think it will depend on um, the veracity of the argument that can be put forward, Chair. As officers, we've taken a view. Um, members in coming to uh, a decision um, need to assess the two, two elements that we've talked about and are framed in those draft reasons for refusal. Um, in terms of an appeal, if you are minded to refuse the application, we would need to support any um, appeal with expert advice to support them. Um, and the view that I would take is if you are minded only to refuse the application on those two grounds, they are arguable grounds that the council can defend. So I don't think they are unreasonable um, issues to refuse the application on but I, I can't guarantee um, in the current state of play with regards to where the, the council's emerging local plan is I can't guarantee that they would be successful but they are at least reasonable planning grounds on which you could base defense I'm sorry I can't I can't give Councillor Foster chair or yourselves um, guarantees on on how any appeal would would be um, would be dealt with uh, I didn't. I didn't need any. Uh, I didn't need that. But uh, thanks for uh, thanks for that answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there's no further questions, we have a motion on the table, so we'll go to the vote. Yeah, just to clarify, the motion is to reject officer recommendations for the grounds specified uh, in the meeting. Chair, now I'll lead members through the vote. We're going to be um, doing a vote by roll call. So I'll call your names in alphabetical order if you could clearly say for, against, or abstain. 
Councillor William Armitage. For. Councillor Jane Barry. Against. Councillor Andrew Cooper. For. Councillor Mark Foster. For. Councillor Carol Huckabee. Just unmuting you, Councillor Huckabee. Could you click unmute? Yeah, sorry. For. Councillor Mo Potts. Four. Councillor Alan Powell. Four. Councillor Tracy Reader. Abstain. Sorry, could you just repeat that, Councillor Reader? Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Jackie Ridgeway. Abstain. Councillor Kathy Rouse. Abstain. Councillor Diana Ruff. Four. Councillor Ross Shipman. Four. Come on. Chair, that is eight votes for, one against, with three abstentions, and therefore the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we can move on to the last item of the agenda. That's item four, matters of ur urgency. As far as I know, there are no matters of urgency. Sorry, Chair, um, you've missed the um, planning appeals lodge and determine date. And that oh, I do beg your pardon. It's been a long day. If you'd like to take us through those, that's not on my agenda anyway. Following the... Um the large number that members saw at the last uh, meeting chair um, this is quite a short report but members will note that over the past um, week or so we've received a significant number of appeals um, so really i hope members are still getting those and you're um, you're finding them interesting reading they they help in framing future decisions the way that are arriving at decisions but you've achieved uh, some considerable success chair and that will be reflected in the um, agenda item on this issue at your next meeting. I'll note um, in particular perhaps the, the withdrawn appeal, which was a duplicate appeal of the land at uh, Park Avenue at Tronfield, which you may recall was subject to our discussion at the last meeting, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions, but uh, there's little to say uh, in view of the um, numbers that have come in subsequently, but we are now seeing starting to see the backlog of, of COVID impacted appeals come through. Thank you. Are there any questions on these? No, thank you. We'll move then to matters of urgency. I have none. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any. Confirmation by the clerk. See if you can give them in. No, no what's okay. In which case, I'll close the meeting and I'll thank you all very much for today. I know it's been a long day. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll be back to normality sooner rather than later. Thank you and good. Yeah. Oh, afternoon. Thank you.